Welcome back to the People, Passion, Purpose podcast. It's Nina Cohen with Passion Squared, and it's been 14 months since we last published an episode. And oh my God, do we have some things to catch up on, which is really one of the reasons I brought our last guest from March 2020 back here to the podcast. And of course, that's my therapist. Dr. Nancy Sobel is a psychologist in private practice in West LA, specializing in the treatment of trauma, compulsive disorders, and has been my personal therapist for the past 14 years. Dr. Sobel has worked in the addiction field for over 30 years and has consulted in the development of treatment programs in the United States and abroad. Dr. Sobel is widely known for her work in the entertainment industry and has developed a unique style of therapy for musicians and artists who spend large amounts of time on the road. She helped develop the Music Cares Addiction Recovery Program, a charity for impaired musicians, funded in association with the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences. Dr. Sobel has been involved in disaster relief work globally and recently in Haiti, where she founded a nonprofit to provide assistance with education and mental health services. Dr. Nancy's organization, the Global Adolescent Project, started an initiative called Gap Create, Community for Recovery and Trauma Education, and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, they have gathered a national team of licensed therapists who have been providing pro bono therapy to essential and frontline workers all while taking care (laughs) of clients like me. Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Nancy. Thank you so much, Nina. I always love seeing you and I can't believe it's been 14 months. It was March 27th. That is crazy. Boy, did it fly by in many ways, but yeah. Oh, Yes, nonstop. It, almost like I've completely just blocked it out. <laughs> oh, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> okay, there's so many things I want to talk about. Questions from our community, things that I've been seeing coming up in our Passion Squared community. So let's dive right in. What are some of the most common mental health issues happening right now due to the pandemic and and all the things that have happened in the past year? And how do we begin to navigate it for ourselves and also hold space and help others who are suffering? Nina, (laughs) (laughs) and all of you who are listening, (laughs) let's not start by jumping right in. Let's start by jumping right into self-care. So everyone, if you can, take a nice sit up straight, straighten out your back, take a nice deep breath in, filling your belly with air, and a nice slow exhale out, letting your belly relax back against your spine. And now listen to this until you can no longer hear the sound. Thank you. Thank you. That took about 30 seconds, I think. And I already feel myself a couple of grades lower in terms of anxiety and stress and running and zipping around. So those are some simple things I'm trying to start with solution immediately. Love it. Thank you. So really the biggest thing that we can say in terms of what's going on with mental health right now is stress, Mm. stress, anxiety, and grief. Those are the three big ones And it's so understandable. There's been so much anxiety and stress. We've been isolating. We've been alone. It's been hard to manage things. There's the unknown and the mistrust of information. And there's been a tremendous amount of loss, whether it's loss in your daily activities, loss of human beings in your life, illness. So stress anxiety, 
grief. Those are the big ones. So you just shared with us one way to kind of bring it down a notch. Uh, we had talked about in the last episode in March, 2020, the potential for, and we didn't know much then, but we knew a little and the potential for the long-term effects of trauma and, and processing grief. So can we talk a little bit about what I'm just a person sitting in the world and I don't even know what to do. Like, what do, what's my step? Like, what do I do? How do I manage all of this? And my clients coming, right? The clients are coming into the salon. Of course, they trust their hairdressers. They miss them oh so my much. Gosh, it's so important. Yes. And they just really have so much they want to share. And you know what I was thinking about, Nina, is that especially hairdressers, people in the beauty industry, yes, you provide such an important service, not just in terms of appearance of people, but in terms of really listening to people and giving them a space to relax and talk. And that hasn't happened. Or if you've done it, you've probably had to sneak it. I'm not saying that anyone listening has snuck some <laughs> services in. I'm just saying that maybe you have found some way to work around whatever the rules are and provide some of your normal services. And that's unfortunate. It delegitimizes the value of what you're, you provide by having to sneak it in. And that can create shame, which adds to more anxiety and stress. So it's a lot. And I think the first thing we wanna say is just, yeah, tell your story. The number one solution for shame is telling the story, what's happening. So finding one or two people, it doesn't have to be a huge number, but one or two people that you can trust who can hear you and I love this phrase. I know it's a little bit of psychobabble, but empathic attunement. Empathic attunement. So just think, if you play guitar, you have to tune the strings. When you are connecting with another person, you want to tune in and adjust how you listen so that they feel heard. You know how important this is for you to feel heard. Yes. And how do people show you that they're hearing you? First of all, they make a space for you to complete a sentence. I don't know about you, but right now, the conversations have a lot of pressured speech and everybody's speeding up and the, the tone is louder. I already feel better just from taking the breath and listening to my singing bowl. I've already kind of lowered my tone a little bit, but just having giving people space to talk and really listening providing eye contact, even if it is through the screen, it's something, you know, and noticing your tone and pace when you are talking with each other, because unwittingly, you may be raising your tone or increasing the pace, and that makes your heart beat faster. So we want to try to slow it down, just slowing down. There's a great ad I've seen on TV for Calm, the app Calm. Mm -hmm where it's 30 seconds and you watch the thing go around for the 30 seconds and it has rain and a beautiful fertile plant. Yep. And I think, oh, every time I see it, I make myself do it. And I make myself just take a deep breath with it. 30 I seconds. love that. The iWatch has a breathe, yes. reminder, you know, and it really does. It really like snaps you out of that, that energy. And the Headspace app has great, like three minute, two minute resets. Yes. Insight so timer. Pract so practical, right? Yes. There are so many apps now for mental health. There are apps on managing anxiety and on um, grief and just so many mental health apps. Now, if you do a search, you're going to be astounded at what's available compared to even a year ago. So I, I, I love that. I think that helps. So talking about it, but talking about it, as you said, in a safe space, I love how Brene Brown talks about having a square squad, which is usually like two people. Like it's not, you know, and I know that in the era of social media and not necessarily always understanding how to practice healthy boundaries, we tend to <laughs> vomit all over the world into this wide space, Yes, um, which is actually unsafe. Yes. Right. Yes. So really honing in on, you know, the power of just knowing that someone hears you. 
Well, that's it. I, I was training people off the street in the slum in Port-au-Prince on uh, how to be mental health support, support people. And the first thing we taught is that it's not just a mental activity. You have to use your heart and your head and we literally touch our heads and our hearts. That's the number one thing they learn in terms of creating a safe space for people to share is they're listening, not just with their mind at what the story is, but also with their heart. What do they feel when they hear the other person share their pain? Mm -hmm. And if you can learn that, that's a really good way of connecting. That's empathic attunement. So, I know the phrase really good or all good therapists have a therapist. (laughs) And I obviously believe that as well. So when we're thinking of these salon owners and, and hairdressers that are taking in all of this energy and all this grief and, and pain and heaviness, are you suggesting that they, take space for themselves in their own kind of, you use the term a lot with me, mental health hygiene, really yes. honing in on, on that mental health hygiene. Yes. And, and it's, you know, you do a lot of talking about mentorship mm-hmm. and their mentorship can be in the area of mental health and should mm-hmm. be, in my opinion, in the area of mental health, especially these days, we're still in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, things seem to be getting better, but there's still the recovery ahead of us and people in the beauty industry who have been hit so hard, it's going to take a minute, you Mm -hmm. know, so having a mentor, an emotional mentor, Mm -hmm. a mental health mentor, somebody who will make that space with you and with whom you can also make the space for them. So kind of even peer mentoring, peer Mm -hmm. support. This is a big thing in Haiti that I, I'm sorry to keep mentioning it, but it's no. just such a handy example Sure. because people don't have, for the most part, money for therapy. And also sure. there are very few therapists over there. When I first arrived 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there were 11 thera- psychologists in the country. Wow. No, there were, sorry, there were three psychiatrists in a country of 11 million people. Mm. We now have about 40. Wow. So it's it's still not enough for 11 million people. So getting mental health treatment is going to depend on peer support. And that was a big part of the work I was doing over there is uh, training peer support. And in fact, the next part of our new initiative that we're doing here in the United States for COVID is training, training the frontline workers to give each other peer support in mental health. That's incredible. So we are talking about how important it is to feel heard, feel seen, feel validated in that empathic attunement. I think is that was the term empathic. Yes. Attunement. So what that leads me to is the danger of minimizing people's yes. experiences. And that seems to have happened a lot in the pandemic. Um, where we've had people that are, I've even been called that I'm being dramatic or I'm being intense or I'm being sensitive. And as you know, not many folks even know what's been going on with me because I don't share, I haven't not shared that yet um, with the public, but what, (laughs) how, what are some of the words like, what are some like affirming words that we can say when people are sharing their experience and pain with us? Well, it's such an important question and it's a big, it's a big question. I know it is. And I want to say congratulations if you're being dramatic, intense and sensitive. (laughs) It makes me love you more. Mm. And I know I'm speaking for all of us who know you. Hmm. So thank you for your courage. (laughs) You know, I think of Brene Brown and daring greatly Mm. dare to be sensitive, intense, you know, and maybe a little dramatic. I don't know that you're being dramatic. I think that's might be something that people say when they're avoiding their own feelings, because Mm. I think that the biggest thing of why people shy away from 
emotional expression is it's defensive. They're afraid. They're afraid of their own emotional experience and it threatens them and they try to shut down. So I think that's what that's about. And I think that in our country in the last few years, you know, there's been a lot of value put on not feeling and on strength seen as not feeling. And I think things are changing, thank God. And uh, now there's space to actually be real again and authentic. It's interesting because one of the, one of the back to this empathic attunement and making people being uncomfortable is when over the last, particularly since last June, um, people say, I hope you're awesome. And I'm like, no, I'm actually not. Or I hope you're doing great. And I would say, no, I'm not doing great. Or I hope you're well. And I'm, I'm not well. And nobody knows what to do with that. Like people gloss over it. No, nobody knows what to do with that. And I understand there's no judgment in me sharing this. This is more for an education and awareness for, for all of us. But what, what do you say to someone like me that says, no, actually I'm not okay. So a, a gentle curiosity, not mm. an intense or, 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 um, you know, forceful curiosity. Like be strong, think positive. <laughs> yeah, we're not giving advice. We're, that's not what uh, effective attunement is. Attunement is trying to adjust to what the person is expressing. So a curiosity and an introspective curiosity. What, Nina, what do you mean you're not okay? Tell me more. Why aren't you okay? And maybe I'm not aware of what you're going through. Help me understand. That might sound a little too therapizing. I don't know how you know, sometimes I can't tell in my own body because I'm so immersed. <laughs> well, you know, I therapy. dig it because I'm you know. so therapizing myself. So, I mean, but yeah, of course, just in a your gentle own curiosity, yeah. please tell me more. Can you tell me more? I want to mm. understand. And then dare to give space for the other person to express themselves. You don't have to understand. You don't have to come up with a solution. That's right. That's, I think, a big part of the pressure is people who are listening think they have to come up with a solution. And they often don't realize that the solution is giving the space for a person to express themselves. I know uh, I do a lot of work in trauma. And what, what makes something traumatic is not the event. It's the experience of the event. It's having a place to feel your feelings around the event. It's having the space to have people who can listen and share and hear your experience of what happened. That's what makes something traumatic or not. If you don't have a relational home for trauma, then that trauma will stick with you and you'll have post-traumatic stress. Right. It's interesting because you're right. People just want to provide solutions. Is that a little codependency stuff? I know everyone wants to be helpful, but is there this, let me control this narrative, let me I have to immediately give advice, jump into solutions that are completely out of context and not asked for, by the way. Like I, I didn't think it's codependency. I think it's easy to put that label on it. Codependency is when our helping hurts us. Okay. So what is dependency is more of an addiction. You know, it's, it's that hurting ourselves with the way that we help others. Right. This is more the fear. I think it's fear driven. It's a fear of hearing someone else's pain. And it's almost like it's contagious. And maybe I'll catch it and not be able to get out of it. Yes. Or the fear that I can't be helpful and, and make my friend feel better. So how can I tolerate that? So again, mm -hmm. I think if there's a theme for me today, it's space, giving people space to feel and sit with discomfort tolerating discomfort. That's another psychobabble term, right? Affect tolerance, being able to just sit. You and I have spent a lot of our time kind of staring at each other at the screen. Yes, we have. Saying there are no words. We shake our heads. We cry. It makes me cry talking about it and just share the space. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. 
sometimes all you can do, but it's not nothing. No. Well, it, it, I'm still here. It's May 21st, 2021, and I'm still here. So obviously it's a lot more than nothing. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. Yes. Um, let's talk about, before we both completely lose our shit and <laughs> can't finish this podcast, well, can we talk a little, th- these terms, depression, grief, trauma, seem to be kind of used mental illness, mental, can we just kind of get a little bit of lines drawn around? What are the, what do these things mean? Like, Okay, well, I think the thing that distinguishes each of them, grief, trauma, grief, depression, the things that distinguish them are time, the length of time that you're experiencing, whether it's trauma, grief, or depression, and who's around you able to tolerate the feelings that you need to express will differentiate whether and ex- a traumatic experience goes through normal grief or something we call complex grief and maybe even into depression. So we already talked about traumatic experiencing, which I, I prefer traumatic experience rather than saying a trauma happened. Cause again, we focus on, Oh, you know, the pandemic or the loss of a loved one. That's what happened. It's horrible, but it doesn't make it a trauma unless you don't have, the space to express your feelings around it with someone who can really listen, hear you and be with you in that experience. And then if it goes on for an extended period of time, like grief is normal. When we have a loss, we grieve, we feel sad, we're filled with memories. We think of past times, we look at photographs, music, all of those things that remind us of the person or of the whatever it is that we lost. Maybe some of you have had to shut down salons. Um, It's a lot, right? And when you're cleaning things up and packing, you're going through all these items and everything has a memory. That's grieving. It's normal. And that should be legitimized. Again, give space for the feeling. But if several months down the line, you're still immersed in each one of those details, now it becomes more complex and it can get into a a diagnosis of depression. And how do we know we're depressed? There are several symptoms of depression. One is that your whole rate or pace of your life gets very abnormally slowed down to the point where it you're not speaking in full sentences because you don't have the energy. You can barely get out of bed or you can only go from the bed to the couch. You can't focus on anything. Your attention span is two seconds and then you keep looping around the same thing over and over and over again. And there's a general numbing feeling. So your sleep, your eating patterns, your ability to participate in life and be functional is impaired. And then it becomes depression. Great. (laughs) Check, check, check. (laughs) So you you talked, you, you mentioned sleep and eating. So going back to this mental health hygiene Um, we talked a lot about this, this past year, particularly in the sleep department, which has been sadly missing from my life. And we'll talk about that in a little while, but so what are some just basic things that, that we can do to just check in with our mental health and maybe to have that kind of check-in is this Am I going through a traumatic experience feeling? Am I processing grief properly? Or am I at that, you know, walking into the doors of depression? So let me give you a tool um, for that, which helps you evaluate where you are. And it's Mm. available online. Excuse me. It was developed by Dr. Patrick Carnes from the meadows and he developed it initially for addicts, but I have found it useful for a lot of people. And it's called the Personal Craziness Index. And what it does, and you can find them online. I'm sure you can find them. And I'll add the link into the podcast show notes. Wonderful. 
So it's, it describes 12 areas of your life. And what you do is you develop three symptoms in each area, like area, like cleanliness, like exercise, like work, different areas of your life, friendships, and three signs that you're off your game in each one of those areas. So you end up with 36 signs that you're off your game. And then you pick the top seven and you do a daily checklist. Have I hit any of those signs that I'm off my game? And obviously you wanna be as close to one or two as possible, not up around six or seven. Right. And you can add the numbers and chart it, you know, it depends how obsessive you are, you know, right. if you'd like to make charts of yourself, but it's a great way to kind of check in how crazy am I? And then you can develop a toolkit for yourself of how I'm going to deal with each one of those symptoms and how that will make me not a warning sign, but actually a call to action. And a self-awareness. And for those of you that may be uncomfortable with the term crazy, um, this is a term that we can use ourselves, right? We don't yes. want to be called crazy, but obviously right. that, right. you know, context right. is ev context is everything. Yes. I don't For mean sure. to be insensitive. With no, that I, term. Well, of course not. Of course. But the main that's thing, a great tool. That's a great tool. And it's so applicable to so many people. And the main thing in that tool is the word balance. Mm. So what's our solution for these things? We're creating space. We're creating some kind of relational experience where you can share your feelings and balance. So same thing when people go on diets, you can't just live on your diet. It, we already know it doesn't work. So you have to have those days where you let loose a little bit. I don't like the word cheat days because it makes me feel bad. I just no, say I that's a shaming it's loosening. A, yeah, yeah. So balance. That's what it is. The other thing is minimizing how much you watch news or listen to news. And one that is probably not very popular, but minimizing social media. Because I support that a thousand percent. The, or taking the social media breaks yeah. that we've talked about in the past. And I know you do periodically. Yep. Yep. So again, that fear of missing out is so huge. And especially when we've been socially distancing, we've really needed the social media to feel connected. But at the same time, it can be a, a, an, a, an, what's the word, you know, something to beat ourselves up with. I mean, the careful. comparison, the, the feeling less than the exactly. loss of perspective, the anxiety also, that people are posting their pain. They're posting stuff that makes you think, oh, they're fine. Right. You know, remember, Everybody's fine. fine. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. What is fine? fine. <clears throat> you remember? Fine. F Ooh, it's been a long time. Fucked up, insecure, fucked up, neurotic, insecure. neurotic and emotional, neurotic and emotional. Gosh, I'm fine. Was that goes fine. back to 2007. That's a long right. time. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. So I just want to say one, two yes. other tools. Cause I want to make sure that we're talking about tools, gratitude, oh, okay. practicing gratitude. I'm a big fan of gratitude lists and also of affirmations. Affirmations are sentences that are positive in nature about myself and start with the words I am. So I am able to handle my stress. Well, I am able to remain calm in adversity. I am able to form friendships with people who really care about me. I do it in traffic sometimes. I just make up affirmations and it makes me giggle and it gets stupid, but it can be something very positive. So that positivity and just a formula that's very helpful with regard to positive versus negative thinking is, sure, I'm gonna have some negative thoughts, but every time I catch one, I try to make up five positive thoughts for every negative. I love that. That's what I do with rational and irrational the thinking, yes. you know, the, yes, the catastrophizing that, that yes. I personally do all day, every day. Yeah. It's that, <laughs> that self-awareness is so big though. Cause all of this is just self-awareness. We're still going to have these feelings. We're still going to have these yes. situations, but it's what tools do we, can we grab instantly like gratitude? Um, I pray like a motherfucker, um, constantly because that just obviously gratitude is daily, but prayer is just so quick for me to be like, God, <laughs> like exactly. help me. And it doesn't have to be God. It can be whatever air, sky, spirit, whatever, but, I, but that's it's great. not just self-awareness. 
again, I cannot always be self-aware. The only way I catch it is when I share with a friend and it can be so casual. The other day I was coming into my old office where, you know, I hadn't been working in over a year and the landlords here have been very unforgiving in terms of any kind of break on the rent mm. and what have you. And when I came into the building, the whole building is being refurbished. And by the way, they increased the rent by a lot wow. because of quote unquote tenant improvements. And I looked at the building and I thought, are you telling me this is owned by a na big national corporation? I'm sure that they got some kind of government assistance to help them with this refurbishing. And yet they still passed it on to their tenants, who many of whom, like myself, have not been in the office for over a year. And I was so resentful. And I was mm. sharing with one of my friends. And she said, Nance, I just want to point this out. You're grieving a lot of stuff right now. I, too, have had really close friends pass this year and have had a lot of losses myself. And she said, maybe you're so focused on this resentment because it's distracting you from your pain. Mm -hmm. And I loved her for that. And I, it felt right. It felt like, yeah, I can get really angry at this stupid thing because then I don't have to quite have the impact of the real pain. And yes. it was very helpful to hear it. And now I've been able to kind of chuckle at myself when I walk around here. <laughs> I love that. I have, okay, so there... Obviously, there's there's so much we want to talk about, but th there was a question we got from our community that I thought was so, so important to talk about. So let's say like you, you've been home. Many people have been home. Um, it, but, you know, a lot of stylists and salons, they've been open for a while. However, there's a new shift happening now, and that's the po potential of removing masks, the potential of yes. indoor dining, the potential of, uh, you know, the arts opening back up and all of that. And the question was reintroducing yourself to common touch and being around others. Um, as an introvert, how do we behave? Like, it, like, how do we re-enter? Is there anything like that we can do to take care of ourselves and make sure our own needs are met as we re-enter society? Okay, so I want to make sure I'm understanding the question because you threw in that word as an introvert. Mm -hmm. And that's not everybody is an introvert and they are re-entering society. This so particular people, person, right, for yeah, some people. Some people even being able to social distance legitimized their comfort level of like, Oh good. I don't have to be around people and I don't have to, That'd so, be me. <laughs> you know, so yes, we have, but how do we, how do we look like, is there anything to kind of like set ourselves up for taking care of ourselves as we start to actually see people face to face again? Well, for one thing, it's a remember, remember it's safety because you do want to be careful still if you're not vaccinated, if, um, you know, if you're being exposed to people who you don't know if they're vaccinated or not, you have to make sure that you practice safety because this thing is still highly contagious. We're seeing what's going on in India. Yeah. And, you know, people will be traveling from India here not and other places in the world. I don't mean to just poke the finger at India, poor India, but you know, this is going to be around a while and there's no guarantee of safety. So we need to practice being safe. That's first things first, right? We remember uh, this guy, Abraham Maslow and the mm -hmm. hierarchy of needs. Safety mm -hmm. comes first. We can't enjoy life if we're not safe. So that's the first thing. Yesterday, I saw a client who I hadn't seen. I saw a client in person who I hadn't seen in 14 months. Wow. And the two of us, we knew it was happening. We were sending each other emojis and things in anticipation. <laughs> and then he came in and he sat down. And I swear for the first 10 minutes, we kept just staring at each other and saying, it feels so good to be in person and feeling each other's energy in a different way than we could do. I, I mm -hmm. saw him, of course, regularly through Zoom, but that's not quite the same. No. And it was just lovely to just give ourselves the space to enjoy being in each other's company. 
I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Exactly. No, I think it's, I, I think you are. I, I, I think that the, it, it's a question. It's interesting that you brought up the safety because that's a question that, that I've been using with our clients at Passion Squared since the beginning of the pandemic. What do you need to feel safe? Yes. And that's a question to ask yourself as an owner, as a leader. That's the question to ask your team. Yes. Your family, because that is the utmost, utmost yes. important thing. And I think that's the question. It's still that question. And we're all going to re-enter differently. As you know, I, I attended a funeral last week and yes. flew for the first time. And um, I did a lot of work up front to answer that question. What do I need to feel safe? What do I need to feel safe? Um, and it, it allowed me to enter a very difficult situation, um, in my current mental state, which is not good, um, and survive. I survived. I, I'm, you know, I, I made it through, um, uh, you and I have not, obviously we haven't had a chance to process that yet, which yes. we will eventually, but yes, my point being is that was the question. That was the question. So the other thing, I just want to say it, it's it might not be popular, but I'm going to say it. Masks are our friends. Yes. Yeah, I, and the use of mask. I agree. You need to really think, do I need it? Don't I need it? And, um, you know, if somebody's coming in here, for example, in my office, I have an extra super duper air purifier now in mm -hmm. here. And one of the improvements in the building is they changed the air purification system for the whole building, but the windows do not open. Mm -hmm. So the door closes, the windows are closed and you're in an enclosed space. And yes, we can be six feet apart, but we're still close and people yes. are crying and snotting and, you know, things right. in my office. Like oh, I have cried and snotted <laughs> a lot in that room you're sitting in right now. <laughs> exactly. So we have to think, you know, what do you feel safe with and, yeah. and assessing that. And it may be different for everyone. Yeah. And, and you know, I have plenty of hand sanitizer handy yeah. and, you know, all of that stuff. I think I was the only person at the funeral that kept the mask on. Of course, it was me and the the service providers, right? Yes. The 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 wait staff and bartenders and stuff like that. Anyways, yeah. Again, what do I need to feel safe? That's the question, and no judgment to anyone's answer, whatever that That's answer right. may be. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's talk about before we um. Before we get into me, uh, what do I do as an individual that does not have access to a therapist? This is, I know, a huge global issue. Um, and like you said, some apps have popped up over the last year. But who do, I, how do I know who to trust, who to believe, what resource is legitimate? What, what do I do? What so do we do. Yes. So certainly the apps. YouTube is your friend. <laughs> There's a lot of resources on there for mental health, depending on your, your circumstances and your, what the symptoms are. And the main thing I would say is, does it help? Try it. You know, Try something on YouTube and see if it helps you. I do want to mention this wonderful thing that um, I actually did a training in it this year called Havening. Haven, like a safe haven. Mm -hmm. Havening. And there's a wonderful woman named Dr. Kate Truitt, T-R-U-I-T-T. She's also on YouTube. She does trainings in havening. And it's a wonderful technique, kind of related to something called EMDR, which is used for treating trauma. But havening can be used for just any old person on any old symptom. It doesn't have to be something really big and clinical, but just for managing your stress. And I just want to do a quick reminder that when we have stress, we have some very normal responses to stress, right? There's fight, flight, or flee, run away. But sometimes there's another level of that in which we kind of are negotiating a little bit. It's more than, you know, it's not as clear cut as fight, flight, free, flee. And what you want to do is you want to calm down your brain. So when our brain perceives danger or excitation or any of those things that send us off balance, it goes through different parts of our brain 
and gets processed differently. And what I love about havening without getting too scientific in the brain and all of that stuff is that it uses several different parts of the brain to treat the problem. And one of the things that it, you do is you just basically, it's called a butterfly hug. So you hug yourself and you just slide your hands from your shoulders to your elbows and back up again. And I'm doing it right now. Another way to do it is just kind of as if you are washing your hands, but you're just gently rubbing your hands just as if you were washing them. Another thing you can do is touch the sides of your face gently, both hands, both sides. But using both sides of your body is very important in any of these soothing activities because it, it, talks, it confuses your brain from the fight, flight, flee. That is hard to say fast. Really and um, you can also rub your head, your temples. So that behavior is very helpful in terms of self-soothing and is one of the first steps in havening. Another thing that you do with the havening is you evaluate on a scale of zero to 10, similar to EMDR, where zero, you're neutral, and 10, you're really excited in either a negative or positive way. It doesn't matter. You're off your neutral stance. You, you set yourself at a number. Where am I right now? Like right now, I'm kind of at a two, probably. I'm trying to stay on my game and make sure I answer your question. So I'm not <laughs> completely neutral, but I'm not super intense. Sure. Um, if I think about um, an event that happened a couple of months ago that I went through with my closest friend, that can put me at an eight or nine even today. So what I want to do is I want to reduce myself from an eight or nine down to zero to three. And so I start with the havening touch, but then we're gonna also use another part of our brain. This is the genius of havening. We're gonna use a different part of our brain to kind of distract it from things. And there are four different categories you can use. I'll try to be quick about this. One is movement. So let's say you really enjoy swimming. So what you do is you do 10 strokes of a swim. So you start with the, how, where I'm, am I zero to 10? Then I do some havening touch. Then I pretend I'm swimming for 10 strokes and just count it out. Then I can choose another category. There are four categories. So one is movement, that's the swimming, but you can use anything. Let's say you're playing volleyball or for me, surfing. And then the, the next one is categories. So like you can pick five fruits that start with the letter A or five um, countries that you've visited in your lifetime or bodies of water, planets. So your categories and you're just naming, naming things. You're confusing your brain. You're making it work in the front part of your brain, which is the decision making, which helps you settle down. The third category is numbers. So you can count backwards from 20 by two. Mm. So 20, 18, 16, 14, that kind of thing. Uh, you can pretend you're climbing upstairs and you count the steps. So if you're not a math genius, you don't have to make it super complicated. <laughs> so there's movement, categories, numbers. And the last one is songs. And you just sing a couple of lines of songs. And before I'm going to be honest, Right before we got on, I sang my heart out. <laughs> it just helped me and I did some havening touch and it just calmed me down to get ready for the podcast. So you pick these four, you develop a sheet where you have what you're gonna use in each category, movement, categories, numbers, songs. And then you, you do, so just to review again, how do we do this? This is sort of CPR for that part of your brain that's on, ah, what's going on? Yes. So the first I'm rating myself zero to 10. I'm doing some havening touch. Then I'm picking three out of those four categories that I just mentioned, movement, categories, numbers, songs. And I'm going to do three of those things. So I'm going to pretend I'm swimming for 10 strokes. I'm going to do the five things in the category. Maybe I'm going to sing a few lines 
And then I'm going to go back to the havening. And then I'm going to check in with myself with a nice deep breath and see if my number has shifted in the zero to 10. And I just keep doing it until it goes down. That's havening. And it might sound kind of kooky. It's super simple and is amazingly effective. That's incredible. And it's on YouTube. While I'm uh, touting some resources, there's another resource that I've mentioned to you before with regard to sleep. It's a doctor by the name of Dr. Ruben Nyman, N-A-I-M-I-N. Check him out on YouTube. He's a sleep expert that has worked with Dr. Andrew Weil, you know, who started all the true food restaurants and yeah. is a very holistic doctor, um, integrative medicine doctor. And Ruben Nyman does wonderful stuff on the idea of sleep and what can help to get your sleep back in check. I think that's great. And that, you know, reminded me of um, at, at one point early this year, we were, you, we were doing these twice a day check-ins. And, um, when you mentioned earlier, this peer, this peer support, this peer yes. mentoring, this, this peer thing and, and having somebody to check in with. And again, I know it's yes. not the replacement for therapy, but when you think about all yes. these different, you know, things that, that we talked about, that's, that's a great, those are great resources. Those yes. are great resources. And the question you asked, is it helping? Right. Yeah. There's a bunch of bad information as we all know. And what internet. may work for you won't work for me. And vice versa. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Is it working? What a great question. <laughs> so that's a great question to move into a little update on what's been happening with me, which I have chosen not to share up until today. And I'm doing it in the safety and support of, of my therapist. Um, <laughs> and that question, is it working? And sadly, um, up until today, May 21st, 2021, absolutely nothing has worked for my current depression and my complex grief and trauma. And for, for context, this depression episode began in December, 2019. So this was not pandemic related. Um, this was not, nothing necessarily happened that day, that month. Um, except one thing that Dr. Nancy and I began to talk about because of my age was, uh, menopause. And is it possible because it, it is proven scientifically proven. And Nancy will of course back this up that, menopause can trigger um, depression in folks that have never had it and make it four times more plus worse for people that already have depression. Yes. So I went to the doctor and had some blood work done and it was confirmed that my hormones were completely out of whack. And so I was a little hopeful, you know, we, we started some hormone replacement therapy and it seemed like a really cool idea. At the same time, we were looking for some alternative treatments and therapies because I have what's called treatment resistant depression. I cannot take antidepressant medication. We've been down that road. We were there in 2007 and eight. I almost didn't make it out of that experience. And so I am pretty much not open to trying any medical, um, you know, traditional medical approach. So we had made some plans and, um, to get treatment. And then sometime in February decided that we didn't like the options that were available to me here. And I was going to go, um, back to Southern California for the summer and spend the summer with my mom and get some specialized, um, mental health support in Los Angeles. And then the pandemic hit. And of course I went into instant work, work, work to support our clients at passion squared. Um, and was planning my, you know, my trip home. And that's when everything completely fell to shit. So I think the hormone replacement therapy worked for a little bit, but it's kind of hard to tell because I was working 18 hours a day and planning a move and, and all of this, the day I arrived at my mom's house, May 13th, 2020, um, I wasn't even able to walk in the door when she jumped in the car and said, we got to go. And her best friend was dying, who was my, um, second mom, my other mom, my other mom. And, um, that began 
uh, five weeks of hell. Um, a week after my mom's best friend passed, my recovery sponsor died, who was also for a long time, very much like family to me. And then out of nowhere, we lost my mom towards the end of June. Um, Literally out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> lost. Yeah. Out of nowhere. And so um, it was uh, a traumatizing experience to say the least. And obviously I'll talk more about that as months and days come. I have not yet talked about that experience and it's been, um, well, it's been almost a year. It'll be a year next month. Um, as you, know, you haven't used the terminology that you just used in the yeah. whole year, we've been talking about this. Right. So as Dr. Nancy said, our therapy sessions for the past year, many times are just sitting in silence because I have not yet been able to discuss any of the events that happened um, last year. So uh, meanwhile, I still didn't have any treatment for my depression. And so I came back to Portland in July. Of course, my summer vacation was canceled. I came back to um, Portland in July and started seeking alternative therapies. In this case, I was looking for psilocybin therapy, which has already been proven to help in some cases with PTSD, with depression, um, things like that. And so that took months and months and I couldn't find help. And the help that we found kept falling through. And it wasn't until the end of January that I was able to attempt my first treatment. All in all, in all, I spent um, 22 hours between January and February in psilocybin treatment, and it did not work. Um, all the while, of course, working with Dr. Nancy. So needless it to say- might have even had some adverse effects. May have. For you. Have, for me. And again, I'm pro alternative treatment therapies. You got to do, again, what works for you. But basically it was- over 12 months of, of, of white knuckling, of holding on, of hoping that something would help. And at the end of that experience, about mid-February, I was done. I, um, I, there's no help. There's no hope. And what do you do when you feel helpless and when you feel hopeless? Um, and I've been here before the whole reason I met Dr. Nancy in 2007 was I was in a very dark time in my life. I was feeling very suicidal and, um, I had the resources and the wherewithal for some reason to put myself into a, um, 35 day inpatient treatment program. It saved my life. Dr. Nancy saved my life, my recovery sponsor helped save my life. Um, and I have not stopped working on this, but you know, we get tired. People with depression get tired. And when people are like, stay strong, it's like, you have no fucking idea how strong I, you have no fucking idea how strong we are. Like <laughs> you wouldn't even believe, you know, what it takes, like you said, to just get out of bed, to go from the bed to the couch, to take care of our basic needs, like showering or, or cleaning the sheets. I, I always check in with Nancy. I'm like, I washed my sheets. <laughs> like you think about that and it's like, are you kidding me? And it's like, no, uh, it's like, that is a, that's a, that's a huge, huge victory to, um, to finally get the energy to, um, to wash your sheets. So, and can I just say one other thing there yeah. Nina, that being able to say I'm thinking about suicide or I can't stop thinking about suicide or I've thought about how I would do it if I was going to do it is really important to be able to say, and it's not the same as actually doing it, No, but having sometimes it's soothing to be able to just discuss it as an option. I'm not encouraging it or no. in any way saying that's what you should do. But the idea of being able to say it out loud yeah. is extremely important. And again, in a safe place. And there are maybe, I would say, 
three other people besides Dr. Nancy, who even had an idea that this was even what was going through my mind. And of course I trust Dr. Nancy, the biggest fear I've had and why I have not talked about this publicly is because I have been so paranoid and afraid that people would come get me, take the dogs that I would be, um, admitted, locked up, yeah. locked up. And, um, and so that's one of the many reasons that I have chosen to keep this, to keep this very quiet. So as Dr. Nancy and I were in the, in the grips of this, um, she said something to me that, that really just completely like, like hit home with me. And that was, this is not, um, th this approach that any type of approach to try to deal with all this, the, the complicated grief, trauma, and depression, it's, we're not going to be able to do it that way. She said, we need to break this stuff up a little bit, like chunk it out a little bit. It's, it's obviously we are at a, at an impasse and, and, and the only way that I have a chance of making it is if we can break this apart and deal with the complicated grief and trauma one way. And then see if we can go back to this underlying deep depression and, and, and handle it differently. And so, you know, sometimes it takes a minute to like realize that you like things that have worked for you in the past, we, we, we so easily forget. And Dr. Nancy said, I think it's time to go back to the meadows. I think it's time that you get some specialized treatment at the recovery um, center that, that saved your life, you know, in 2007. Yes. And so I thought about it. I thought about it for, for a little while and I finally made the call and this coming Sunday, May 23rd, I am getting on a plane headed back oh. to Arizona for a five day intensive, um, centered around grief and trauma in hopes that in hopes that this will allow me a little space to begin talking about what happened, which means going through those stages of, of grief, because this is delayed grief, right? I mean, this is so cruel and painful. And what so many folks have been navigating, you know, going back to this, this pandemic is far from over and, and, and it's, it's going to be a long time. We're still just having funerals, you know, and, yes. and doing these, um, you know, these rituals that are so critical to healing and so critical to processing. And so, um, so yeah, so that I said a lot, so that is basically, um, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> that's what we're going to do. We're going to try it. We're going to try it. And I am doing my best not to be overly, like overly high expectations. And to be honest, like the way that I'm, I'm moving through the world right now is so numb that I don't even know, like, I almost wouldn't be surprised, like if something awesome happens or something awful happens and either way I'm here, right? Yes. Either way I'm here. And depending on how this treatment goes, um, I will revisit maybe psilocybin therapy again and other alternative therapies. Um, but the truth is, is that I have not been well and it has not been safe to discuss not being well. And I feel a little bit more courageous and a little bit safer today than I did a month ago. And um, a lot of that has to do with the decision to go get some inpatient style help in a place that I feel safe, a place that I trust. Yes. And, um, and yeah, so. Very courageous, Nina, to share your experience. And I hope that it inspires others to find their safe place. Yeah. So for those of you that are, are listening, um, I am going to add all of the links and resources into the show notes. So these will be hyperlinked in Apple podcasts and on our website. So it's literally a click away, a click away to an app, a click away to um, some of the, you know, resources that, that Dr. Nancy 
um, offered up to us today. And of course, a conversation that we'll continue to have as we process, as we heal, as, um, as, as, as we learn more. So Dr. Nancy, thank you so much for always being so generous. Thank you for being our first guest back. I'm so honored, Nina, and so respect your courage and openness. And I really do hope we get you some relief. And I hope that those are, who are listening have at least one person with whom you can share your feelings and make space to hear one another. Thank you. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for your trust, for your love and your support. And to Dr. Nancy, who is our therapist at Passion Squared and <laughs> um, our, our lifesaver. We love you so, so much and are just so forever grateful for you. We are linked. <laughs> we are linked. Thank you all so much for listening. And again, please reference any of the show notes for resources. You can always find us on Instagram at Passion Squared at passionsquared.net or email us at awesome at passionsquared.net. Thank you so much for listening. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you, Nina. <laughs>